Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Check out a free trial of Skillshare Premium by clicking the link in the description below. Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video, we'll be looking at the meaning behind Poisson's equation. Thank you very much for voting for this topic in the poll over on my community tab. As always, we'll be trying to deal with this rather complicated mathematical equation without going into too much heavy mathematics. So if you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Now, the general form of the Poisson equation can be written like this. We'll be looking at the meaning of each one of these symbols in a moment. But before we do, you may have seen the Poisson equation written in a few different forms. For example, like this as well. This is the version of Poisson's equation used when studying gravitation. We'll be taking a look at that too. But first, let's focus on the more general form. We'll start by understanding the mathematical meaning of each one of these symbols and then applying some physical intuition to it. The first thing we see in our equation is this downward pointing triangle squared. This symbol has a very particular meaning in vector calculus. The first thing we need to know is that the downward pointing triangle is known as a nabla or a del. And we can think of it as a vector containing partial derivatives d by dx, d by dy, and d by dz. Each one of these measures how quickly a certain quantity changes over a small distance in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. So for example, if we have a packet of flour, and we open that packet, and then we squish it, so the flour goes everywhere. And then we plot how much flour is found at every point along the x direction, for example. Let's say our flower distribution looks like this. Lots of flower near the origin, and then less and less as we get further away from the origin. Well, if our flower distribution is labeled f, let's say we want to find df by dx. This simply measures how quickly the flower distribution changes as we move along the x direction. We can think of this as measuring the gradient or slope of our flower distribution. Over here, for example, the gradient is quite steep, so our flower distribution drops off quite quickly. Whereas over here, the gradient is not so steep, so the flower distribution isn't changing a huge amount in this region. Now, we could apply what's known as the Nabla operator to our flower distribution function. And the first term essentially would just give us df by dx, as we've seen, except we've got curly d's here. We don't have normal d's. Luckily, though, there's a simple way to think about the curly d's. If we realize that the flower distribution doesn't just change over the x direction, it also changes over other directions, and the change in other directions might be different to the change in the x direction, then we can understand that the curly d's are telling us that we're only measuring the change of our flower distribution over the x direction, whilst assuming that the flower distribution remains constant in other directions. Similarly, curly df by dy measures how quickly the flower distribution changes in the y direction, whilst keeping everything else constant. And so we can think of the curly d's as essentially isolating the change that we're trying to look at in a particular direction without worrying about any other direction. If you're unfamiliar with partial derivatives, by the way, I'll leave some resources in the description box below. Anyway, so this is what the downward pointing triangle nabla or del represents. As always, we've just sort of scratched the surface. There's obviously a lot more to it than that. But for the purposes of this video, we've covered what we need to know. The thing is, though, Poisson's equation actually has del squared rather than just del. Now, if we're thinking of squaring a vector, how, how does that work? Well, del squared is simply a notation that is actually used to represent del dot del. That's the dot product between two del vectors. For those of you familiar with gradient divergence and curl, what we're actually looking at here is the divergence of the gradient of some quantity. But that's not what's important here. What is important is that the dot product or the scalar product between two vectors is given by multiplying the corresponding components of those two vectors and then adding up all these little products. And we do a similar thing when finding the dot product between these two del vectors, except we don't multiply together the components. What we're technically doing is applying a partial derivative on a partial derivative in all three cases. And then we add them together the same way we would for a normal vector. Again, for those of you familiar with calculus, we can write these as the second derivative in x, y, and z of the function f, whatever f may be. And on the other side of our Poisson equation, we have some other function. We haven't really specified what this function is, but all we're saying is that in this particular case, the function f has to be such that the second derivatives, as we've seen on the left-hand side, have to all add up to give us this other random function, phi. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to thank this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find a large number of inspiring classes focusing on topics such as productivity and lifestyle, to building a business, to learning creative skills. 
Many of you may know that one of my hobbies is creating music. Check out my music channel linked below. And I've taken some classes on Skillshare that have taught me some really cool skills. For example, I took a class called Audio Mixing on the Go, Professional Sound Without the Studio by King Arthur, which gave me lots of tips for improving my mixes without lots of fancy equipment. And that's the key here. Skillshare has a large number of classes to choose from, and it's all about learning, so there are no adverts. And Skillshare costs less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. But the first 1,000 of you to click the first link in the description box below will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Please do go check it out, and big thanks to Skillshare once again for sponsoring this video. Now, so far we've had a very generic look at Poisson's equation. Nothing specific, nothing intuitive, because we've just said that the functions found in Poisson's equation are just some random functions. They've not really represented anything physical yet. So let's have a look at that. Let's look at how Poisson's equation is used in the study of classical or Newtonian gravitation. We'll start by considering a law in classical gravitation known as Gauss's law. Gauss's law deserves a video of its own and I'll leave some resources in the description below if you're unfamiliar with it. Gauss's law looks a little bit like this, and to understand it, let's imagine that we're considering the gravitational field of the Earth. We may know already that Earth's gravitational field is meant to look like this, radially inward pointing gravitational field lines, meaning that any little mass placed at any one of these points will accelerate towards the center of the Earth. But how do we know that Earth's gravitational field looks like this? Well, this is where Gauss's law comes in. We begin by considering a random surface, a closed surface, that entirely encapsulates the Earth. For simplicity's sake, we will consider this spherical closed surface. Then we break up this arbitrarily chosen surface into lots of little area chunks. We'll say that each one of these has a little area dA, and what we can also do is to represent each one of these surfaces with a vector. That vector is exactly perpendicular to each one of these surfaces, so instead of a surface, we now just think about a vector, and the size of that vector corresponds to the area of the surface. This, by the way, is a really clever way to represent surfaces in general, because you can simply think of one single vector rather than a whole flat surface. We get all the information we need from the vector, because the direction in which the vector is pointing we know is directly perpendicular to the area, and the size of the vector gives us the size of the area. And so this is how we mathematically encode something about those little area surfaces into our working. Next, we see that Gauss's law tells us that we want to find the dot product between the gravitational field at every single point in space, which is exactly what we're trying to find here, and the little area vectors dA. The dot product, by the way, is a measure of how well two vectors align with each other. So if they're both pointing in the same direction, then the value of the dot product is as large as it can be. And if they're both exactly perpendicular to each other, then the value is zero. And in this case, then we're simply measuring how well the gravitational field line aligns with our little area vector. Or another way to think about it is how much of our gravitational field lines pass through those little area elements. So we find the dot product, g dot dA, for each one of these little area elements. And then we add up all the contributions to find what's going on over our entire closed surface. And that's exactly what the integral sign is about. It's telling us to add up all of those little contributions. And the sum over the entire closed surface must be equal to minus four pi g m, where g is the universal gravitational constant and m is the mass enclosed within our closed surface, in this case, the mass of the Earth. Now, finding a solution to this is quite tricky, but we do find that the gravitational field along this entire surface must look like this. And when we choose other arbitrary surfaces for which to do this same process again, we find that the full gravitational field of the Earth looks like this. Just as an intuition thing, by the way, there's a negative sign here because the little area elements had vectors that pointed out of them, whereas the gravitational field points in the exact opposite direction, it points inward. So Gauss's law can help us find the gravitational field of anybody we happen to be considering. And we've been looking at Gauss's law in integral form, but it can be written in differential form which looks a little bit like this. What we see here is that the divergence of g is equal to negative four pi g rho, where all the symbols have the same meanings apart from rho, which is actually the mass density. That's the mass per unit volume in our enclosed surface. Now, again, we don't need to worry about what divergence actually means, but we can see that this equation that we've got looks pretty similar to Poisson's equation from earlier. We've got some function on the right-hand side, minus four pi g rho, and the only difference is that we've got the divergence of some vector quantity rather than del squared of some scalar function. 
Luckily for us, the gravitational force is what's known as a conservative force. What this means is that if an object is placed in a gravitational field and then moved to some other point in that gravitational field, it doesn't matter how it got from point A to point B. The work done in order to take the object from point A to point B is the same, regardless of how it got from A to B. Now, mathematically, this translates to the curl of the gravitational field being equal to zero. How that's equivalent, we'll discuss some other time. But the important thing here is that there's a mathematical identity, so not anything to do with physics, but it's all purely mathematical, that says that the curl of the gradient of a scalar field is always equal to zero. And because we've seen that the curl of our gravitational field must be equal to zero, what this tells us is that we can write our gravitational field as the gradient of a scalar field. We can write that G is equal to grad V, where V is a scalar field at which point we can go back to Gauss's law and substitute in grad V for the gravitational field G. And so now what we have on the left-hand side is the divergence of the gradient of some scalar field V. But also remember that del dot del is equal to del squared. And so we've arrived at the Poisson equation for gravitation. This is a specific use of the general Poisson's equation we saw earlier in the video. We arrived here by starting with Gauss's law and then remembering that gravity is a conservative force field. By the way, the scalar field that we've substituted in here, V, is known as the gravitational potential. Many of you may have heard of this, and it's quite similar to a gravitational potential energy, but it's not quite the same thing. What exactly the differences are between those two? Well, I'll leave that for you to dig into. At this point, I'm gonna finish up because this is a long ass explanation already. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe for more fun physics content, and hit that bell button to be notified when I upload. Check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there, and thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Once again, check out the first link in the description box below for a free trial of Skillshare Premium. I really appreciate all your support as always. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you very soon.